Hello, everyone. Good evening. That's a lot of power. I even know as I was standing up here, the room was starting to in a hush. Welcome, um, and thank you for joining us for this fifth installment of the Inspire Jericho Talks. Um, either those of you who are joining us here this evening at UBC Robson Square, those of you who are joining us uh, via live stream, um, thank you, uh, thank you for doing so. I hope you do, all are doing well and uh, staying healthy. My name is Chris Chalk, and I'll be serving as uh, the MC for this evening. You won't hear very much from me at all. Um, and as my first uh, um, uh, duty, I have the honor of introducing Chief Jen Thomas and Councillor Wonak Dennis Thomas from the tsleil -Tooth Nation to provide a welcome. Thank you, and good evening, everybody. I just want to take this time and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Our MST family and uh, Canada lands, you know, I've been watching this process for quite some time, and I remember just watching this video here, having uh, our past leaders in the video, uh, my mom, former Chief Maureen Thomas, Gibby Jacob, uh, Wendy John, you know, those are people that I really look up to and I remember their words and I hold those close to me. It's, uh, it's just amazing how far we've come from that very first video. So I'm glad you guys are here to share us this evening with us. But I also want to take this time and um, give some shout outs. I want to really thank our cultural liaisons for the work that you guys do and keeping, keeping our nations in the minds of everybody in Vancouver. You know, it's a very important role in what you guys have done in the past few years. I hold my hands up to you. I'm so proud and I'm really amazed. You know, you guys are the younger generation to me. So I'm really amazed and my hands go up to how far you guys take our nation, so thank you for that. I also wanna take this time to give a shout out to David Negron and uh, Brennan Cook for all the work that you guys do for our nations. I really appreciate that, you know. We wouldn't be here today without you guys, so thank you for that. Our Canada Lands Corporation, you know, thank you for being a part of our family and letting us be a part of yours. Um, I probably have more to say, but I'll just want to take this time and thank you guys joining us here in the shared territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil -Tooth. Thank you and welcome. And I'm going to let Dennis just open us off with a, a song.
I apologize, I do have one more thing to say. I just want to acknowledge our youth here from the three nations. You know, thank you for sharing this evening with us also. And just to say that everything that I've learned in my leadership role was watching our older generations. So the more events you guys can show up at and be a part of, you'll be here one day because you guys are our future leaders. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Jen and, and Councillor Wonok, uh, for the welcome. Um, I, I also want to acknowledge a few elected officials um, from the uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations who are here with us this evening. Um, from the Musqueam Indian Band, Councillor Allison Fraser, who, <laughs> and Councillor Point, uh, and Councillor Michelle Point. Uh, thank you. From the Squamish Nation, uh, spokesperson and counselor Sequalia Ann Wanak. And from the Tsleil-Waututh Nation, Chief Jen Thomas, counselor Dennis Thomas, and uh, counselor Charlene Alec. Uh, thank you very much. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask Elisa Campbell, who is the Vice President Real Estate West for Canada Lands Company, to say a few words. Thanks, Chris, and uh, thank you to our nation's uh, friends and partners. Uh, bonsoir à tout le monde. Uh, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Like all of you, I am looking forward to hearing our colleagues from the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh share their stories, their knowledge, and their wisdom. But before we launch into the main presentation, I wanted to say a few words on behalf of Canada Lands Company, or CLC for short. Uh, we share ownership of a portion of the Jericho lands with the MST partnership, and it's a project and a partnership that is of tremendous importance to us. CLC is a self-financing federal crown corporation that transforms former Government of Canada properties into great communities. We are guided by values that to consider social impact, environmental responsibility, and financial resilience when redeveloping our properties strong relationships with First Nations, with the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh are a top priority. CLC entered into a joint venture partnership with the MST in 2014 for the redevelopment of the Jericho lands and also of the Heatherlands, which is on the Canby Corridor. Since then, we've been so enriched by the opportunity to work collaboratively with our nation's friends and partners to achieve shared aspirations to create vibrant, welcoming, sustainable, an affordable future community at the Jericho Lens. We're working together uh, to plan the full 90 acres at the Jericho Lens as one comprehensive neighborhood. And this offers us tremendous opportunities to plan a continual public realm along with other social amenities. Uh, the CLC team recognizes and holds dearly the importance of the Jericho Lens to the MST nations. And we support the nations in achieving their long-term goals and aspirations. We also appreciate the opportunity to work collaboratively with the City of Vancouver on this momentous project. And of course, we've been so thrilled all the way along by the opportunity to support the work of the MST nations in expressing and embedding their culture and values in the planning and design of the, of the Jericho lands. And my hands up to our cultural liaisons for the uh, wonderful friendship and partnership as we've gone along. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elisa. Um, we're getting close to the main event, but before um, we, we introduce the cultural liaisons, I want to um, just let you know that following the presentation um, this evening, there will be a brief opportunity for questions, and this is how um, we, will, uh, we will take the questions, is through Slido. So on your device, either here in, in the room, um, or for those of you on the live stream, if you go to slido.com and enter the event code Inspire Jericho. Uh, you'll be able to submit a question that uh, I will have access to later this evening. 
Um, tonight's event is focused solely on MST culture, and so the questions that I uh, take from Slido will be on the topics that the cultural liaisons are presenting on this evening. Um, the Slido is open now, so as the presentation um, is going, if you have a question that you think of, don't hesitate. You know, feel free to jump on there and, and enter the questions. So I uh, just wanted to uh, make sure that you're aware of that. Um, I'll leave this up for a second here so you can uh, grab the link um, either through the QR code or uh, from the link itself. And with that, on to the main event. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage our presenters for this evening. Um, these uh, five individuals who will be up here um, uh, speaking to you over the next uh, little while have been appointed by their respective uh, nation's leadership to serve as liaisons between their communities and the teams uh, that are planning the, uh, the future of Eyalma uh, Jericho lands. Um, this is a role that they will tell you about over the course of their presentation. So please join me in welcoming uh, the cultural liaisons from Musqueam, Charlene Grant, From the Squamish Nation, Skalaltanot, Adrian Charlie, and Sconchton. Sconchton, Calvin Charlie Dawson. And from Slayer Tooth Nation, uh, Dennis Thomas, Wanuk. And Hunnis. Uh, William George Thomas. Okay. Oh, take it away if you grab your, your mics and Here we go. look forward to this. I'm going to stand up. Haichka CM to Siaya, Antha Sasumpkin to Not, Kumaskuyam, Squaw Mission Slewatooth. My name is Charlene Grant. I am the direct descendant of Kayapalano. My father is Susumpkin. I am his daughter, Susumpkin Tanat, the female version of Susumpkin. I come from Musqueam, and I'm very proud Musqueam women, and I'm very proud to be here to share what I have, what I've gained through my father and through my elders and through my community. I have learned through the teachings that have been passed down through generations. I'm working with a great team here. I, I love my, my family, we're all family. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about what I'm wearing tonight. This collar that I have on belongs to my mother. My mother will be 94 come July. So when my mother would go out and upon and do her speaking engagements or do her prayers, and she had the um, utmost opportunity to meet the Dalai Lama, and the Dalai Lama had the utmost opportunity to meet my mother. And I want to tell you, she also, I, I wear her, um, her gift from the queen. And my mother was very honored to have this given to her. She asked that it be to delivered to her herself instead of my mother traveling out to receive it. I just wanted to share that out with you. And then another thing about what I am wearing upon myself is a two-headed sea serpent. The two-headed sea serpent is Sayayas. Sayayas was a two-headed sea serpent that lived in Quamusquium, which we now call the Camosun Bog. He was a two-headed sea serpent that would, that would go in and protect his area because at the, the Camosun Bog there was mallards, there was cranberries, there was food for the serpent to eat. So he would make the sound and pretend that he was the mallard in order to attract the children or the people. Our elders would say, don't go to the musqui. Don't go to there. You're going to be taken away. So after years had passed, years and years have passed, uh, the sea serpent, he made himself present. He came out. He came out through the Camosun bog. He came down through, down to where Musqueam is. He made his way to the Salish Sea. 
So if you're familiar with Musqueam and the Musqueam Territory and the uh, Camosun Bog, you will run into two creeks. Those creeks were created by the two-headed sea serpent, CIS. And one is Cutroth Creek, sorry, Cutroth Cut Creek and Musqueam Creek, my mouth sticking together. But um, I just wanted to let you know a little bit of, it's my garb and it's my mother's and it's my first time wearing it and I'm wearing it proudly. And I must say that um, the young ambassadors, that I have two ambassadors with me tonight from Musqueam. If you could stand up, this is my daughter, Chantelle. She's one of the youngest of my children and my niece, Sierra Cote. If you can give them a hand, please, thank you. Hatskwail Eo tonight. Skalat tonight, Queen Kushaman, Adrian Queen's Na, Tinachin Pla, Hamalchistan Ochomeo, and Slate Queen's Conman Tomeo, Squeeze Clack Nomo Titsits. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Skalautanat, and um, my English name is Adrian Charlie. Uh, I reside in what we call Hamalchistan, the Capilano Reserve, and um, I'm the cultural liaison for Squamish. And it's very exciting to be here as long as um, my colleagues, as Charlene has says, we've become family, and we are family. Uh, the work that we've been doing since 2019 has brought us here today to our fifth Jericho Talks. And we were talking about the first one that we were a part of um, and you know what it's come to from 2019 until now and all the work that we've done in our communities. And you know, bridging that gap between, like as um, Jen had said, um, working with, with the greater community but also with our own communities and we do have two liaisons as well um, with us. I have my daughter, um, Squiamethel, um, Kailana. Um, she's also from Musqueam, and Allison is her, um, her grandma's sister. And I have my nephew, Aya House, um, Preston Peters. And um, I'm really grateful for them to be here because, as they said, a lot of the things that we do, we do for our children and we ensure that they have an understanding of our past, our present, and our future. And when we're thinking of our future, we're thinking of our, ch our children, their children. And I, you know, today we have three generations of our family who descend from Jericho Charlie. And um, it was very important for me to take this position um, as the cultural liaison because Jericho Charlie was my great-great-grandfather. And his, uh, his son was Dominic Charlie, and then his son was Stephen Charlie, and then Stephen Charlie, and then myself. And then we have Sequalia, she's my aunt, my, my dad's sister, and Calvin and Kailana, um, where they're, they're my children. So when we, we think about seeing our, our parents and our, our aunts and our uncles work, we strive to be like them, but we also like to pave our own path as well. As you can see, my children are here. Um, I talk about it, you know, a lot of different times, and I say, you know, if I were to pass away today, can they carry the work on for us? And I understand and I believe that they could. Um, a little bit emotional that I have two of my children here, so it's really nice. Um, and I thank you all for being here, and I'll let Kelvin introduce himself. Thank you. Hatsnat Elchanoyat Anskanchen Calvin Queensna Chinachin Cha Chquath Ochomel Emochin Chinatla Ultra Ochomel Elch Nameth to MST liaisons on Chiapokon Mantum Elchanoyat Clan Nameth Chinquimentomia Quistlak AT Nate Chit to Scopemish Oath Ochomer, a Scopemish Chit. On Chipo Conmantum to Scopemish Ochomer Chit, a On Chipo Conmantum to Swat Arm, a Chisman Hums to A Armor. Good evening, everyone. Um, my ancestral name is Sakanshtin, and my um, English name is Calvin. 
uh, just welcoming you, each and every one of you here to tonight. Um, very happy to see you all. Uh, just after rolling after COVID, it's nice to see people in person again and gather like we once did. You know, um, all three of our nations once gathered on this land, and once again, we will be able to gather there uh, in the near future. Uh, just a bit about the Skokmish people. Uh, this, the name Skokmish is the kind of loosely translate to the Skokmish speaking people, and what the Skokmish people are and the Skokmish nation is, is an amalgamation of about two or three dozen villages that span from all the way as south as New Westminster, as far west as Gibson's Landing, and as far north as uh, Whistler, uh, including all the village sites in the Howe Sound. Um, my ancestral name itself, Tsakonshin, is actually one of the name of five original ancestors that which all the Skokmish people descend from. And just uh, once again, just happy to see every one of you uh, here today. And um, for next is Dennis to introduce himself. Chinko Mentomi up. In translation, good day to you all, respected peoples. Welcome to the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. Wanak is my ancestral name. Uh, my English name is Dennis Thomas. I'm a member of the tsleil Nation. Uh, it gives me good feelings in my squalo, in my heart, and my spirit to be here, um, sharing a little bit of the Hunk Aminam dialect that, that I know. Um, a little bit about tsleil uh, people. You know, we're tsleil Nation means people of the inlet. tsleil means inlet. And Takaya is our form of who we are. You know, our origin story dates back, you know, thousands of years ago to when the Transformer transformed a lone wolf into the first to slay what young boy. And as that young boy was growing up, being surrounded by a lovely wolf family, learned how to gather, learned how to hunt, learned how to be a un uh, walk on this earth with unity and respect and harmony. Eventually, when the young wolves started finding mates of themselves and start growing their family, the young boy was upset at the creator, wondering why there wasn't any of his people around with the two-legged. Eventually, he told him to pray along a long cliff up in Slewat Indi uh, Inlet, which is now known as Indian Arm. We're going to try and change it to Slewat Inlet. And that vision that he received was to jump into this salt water, to swim as far as he can down, to grab all of, this, all of the sediment, all of the shells, everything that he can grab with two hands and bring it back to a beach and, and lay it and surround it with cedar boughs and, and pray. And hours goes by and you know, days go by and finally he woke up and the creator changed all of that sediment into the first to slay what young woman. And from that day on, the, the, the obligations and the duty was to grow into a beautiful family. And that is our story of who we are as Slewitith people, people of the Inlet Wolf Clan. My role here is uh, with the Culture Liaisons, with my lovely family. It's been such an amazing journey. I know that I think this is our very first public presentation we've done. A lot of it's been through Zoom sometimes, and we've worked on Heatherlands. Um, actually, that was in person. But uh, this Ayelmoch uh, is, is coming in into uh, full, uh, full speed, and it's been an honor working with uh, both of you and uh, Konshin and Hannes now. You know, we're passing that transfer of knowledge and, and, and showing that circle of life, which is such a cultural value for our people. It's very uh, an honor to see our young Manu here. So I'll let uh, Hannes share uh, who our representatives are from Slewitooth, but my hands are raised for you for coming here. It takes courage to come out to, to greet and to speak and be proud of who you are and where you come from. I'd also like to raise my hands to our leadership here. Thank you very much for coming, each and every one of you. And my mom, I'd just like to thank everyone. I think the, the vision of 
um, our leaders is very important. You know, this has been decades in the making, and for each and every one of you to make these decisions, for us to be in here in these positions um, to help put our culture on the map. So I just really want to acknowledge you and acknowledge all the ones that have, have passed that have been the visionaries as well. Um, so, Osiem, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, Anta Hunnis, William Kwanasqui. My traditional name is Hunnis, and my English name is uh, William George Thomas. Everyone else stood up. I guess I'll stand up too, actually. <laughs> so I would like to also thank all of my fellow cultural liaisons, as was mentioned by my auntie here, Chief Jen, that uh, the people that she looked up to, and also I look up to, have passed down the information. They're knowledge holders. They're ones that hold our laws that are in the back of their heads. They know all of our shared histories, but also our distinct histories as well. They passed it on, who are now also passing on to um, myself and Calvin here, onto our generation now, and letting us kind of take the torch and allow to share with all of you, the public, of who we are as Huomo people, who we are as the indigenous people that have long resided here since time out of mind. As, Cal as uh, Dennis, sorry, Wanik here, as he mentioned, you know, people of the inlet, if you see like the stories of like the orcas coming back, you know, for thousands of years, you know, this is huge news for us. We love our orcas uh, as we are the people of the inlet. So whenever uh, life is shown in the broad inlet, you know, us here at Slay with Tooth, we get very excited about that. And due to colonization, due to um, industrialization, there was a lot of uh, like different uh, animals. And um, it was 90% of our diet was actually came from our inlet and our waterways up to the Indian uh, River uh, and all around our sacred waterways here. And they're slowly coming back, you know, as as stewards of the land, as we like to say, you know, we're protectors of the land. And as you'll see in this presentation here, you'll see of all the great considerations that are going into this great design. And as mentioned, we do like to pass down all of our knowledge, so I would also like to acknowledge our Tsleil-Waututh Youth Ambassadors, if you two can stand up. We have Colin Antone and Logan Ferrara-George. <laughs> they're, two, they're two proud T TWN community members. They're strong. They also, I'd like to thank them in all these times that they get asked. They do come and be, represent as a youth rep for a lot of different events, whether it's drumming, small openings, or just stuff like this where they're youth ambassadors. They're also members, of uh, their students, leaders in our high school at our grades K to 12 school, uh, Siamfoot, which means to become rich, and that's rich in knowledge. They learn right off the land. They have a very uh, distinct uh, education that's not matched by any other in BC that I'm aware of, at least. They get to learn from all of our community members, and they really get a great uh, education at uh, Siam Foot. And that's it. Thank you. <clears throat> Celebrating. There we go. On to the culture liaison. So, about Ayelmo, you know, I really felt the need that we really need to set the context of it's just not Jericho lands, it's just not the three nations coming together. There was already that relationship thousands of years ago, pre-contact. We had sophisticated, robust, but yet complex systems of trade and bartering. We had uh, networks of traveling to uh, one's territories based on kinship lineage, respect, generosity. These are our indigenous value system. And for us with this specific property, Ayelmo, it was also very known as a large village site that was a center point for trade and bartering, for lasting our economy for thousands of years. There's certain elements and certain jewels that we don't get in this area, but are found in this area, which prove evidence that we did trade with neighboring nations. And it lasted for thousands of years. That's how our relationship, our kinship survived based on mutual trust and, and respect. And because of the act, acts of colonization and uh, you know the Indian Act to, that comes into play that had oppression, uh, uh, oppression laws 
that really stopped our ways of being and stopped our worldview, stopped us from thinking about our worldviews and how we survived for that many years. You know, for example, in 1859 was the first time ever that the indigenous population became the minority because of the Fraser Gold Rush and all the settlers coming up here. 1860 was another very pivotal role um, that the colony of British Columbia did a preemption land act that allowed settlers to take 150 acres of our land while we were getting removed to reserves where we are right now. Six years later, they made it illegal for us to actually do that same thing, to go and actually get our own land back. So for us, this is not just us acquiring a piece of land, it's us regaining that power of the Tumath and of the land and of who we are as the three nations working together. And it only took 150 years later, but here we are. And this is the story that we want to unfold with you today, but embedding it and imprinting our worldviews as it relates to a modern development. We're in a paradigm shift here where the Western development process is changing with MST. It starts with our worldviews, our understanding, our epistemologies and pedagogy, and then it goes to the architects to interpret that and come up with conceptual designs. So this is the stage that we are in today, and we're going to show you a little bit about that today. On to... Um. This uh, pre-contact, uh, a lot of our families lived in Iyamo. And when I talked about Jericho Charlie, um, that's my great-great-grandfather, and his name was Chenaltit. My nephew, um, Gavin, Sequalia's grandson, and my late brother um, carried the name Chenaltit. And the importance of this, this property, to me, is our family that once lived there. And when I think about how our family had, you know, a great longhouse um, that was once on the property. And, uh, you know, people from up and down the coast were known for coming to, you know, to the potlatches that uh, my great grandfather had, had held. And um, in the past, a, a, lot of, a lot of land and uh, everything, it, everything always has to do with land ownership and, war and you know but there is peace and when i talk about the past um you know we do have great warriors and um thinking of Kayapalano, you know we we descend from this man he had a few different wives and one of them um, was squamish one of them was musqueam and i believe the other one was from slyamon um so when we talk about how being related, uh, you know, Charlene and we have Allison and, you know, we all descend from this man. And it, there was great wars that happened between the Haida and the Kukwakiwak. And uh, a lot of the time during these raids, you know, people had come, you know, and it was for the riches, it was for our wealth, it was for resources. And re resources meant women, um, resources meant food and you know, land acquirement. So when we talk about our warriors that once lived in the area, we, we talk about Kayapalano and we talk about the people and you know, being able to, you know, to hold our, our ground and keep our property within our families. And um, you know, there's uh, you know, a, a, lo a larger story to, to some of these wars because one of my friends, um, his name is William Wasden, he comes from the Kokwakiwak, and we were sitting together uh, at a family dinner, and we were, you know, we're telling stories of our history and our, of our legends, and he was telling the story of a great warrior that came from Squamish, and um, the decimation of a whole community within his people. And I, you know, I was listening to his side of the story, and I was like, Oh, I said, that's really interesting. I said, I, you know, I, I come from that family. And, you know, that property that we're talking about, you know, we, ha we have a, it's a long standing um, area of where we hunt and where we celebrated. And it was a, a big part of uh, a place for canoe building as well because of the great cedars that once grew there. And if you take a look at some of the older pictures, um, you know, some of our, our bigger canoes can hold a ton 
of cargo. And a lot of the cargo was the, the rich food that was once in Yalmok, and that was um, elk um, smelt. And there was also a little bit further over, there was a great crab apple orchard, and um, that's closer to Locarno Beach. So when we think about the rich resources that we once have, and you know, we talk about, Dennis talked about our, the economy that we had, a lot of that was because of the, the area that, that, you know, that that area was. It was rich in the hunting grounds, and you know, Dominic Charlie and his brother, um, Hotsolano August Jack, would travel from our, you know, our villages in Squamish, where, you know, where they lived, and then you know, come down through the Indian arm and across and you know, have their summer home in Yelmo. And um, when we talk about the, you know, the induction of colonization, um, Jericho Charlie's um, living longhouse was actually taken apart piece by piece, labeled and brought um, to Germany. And uh, our celebration home, which we call uh, a Smithla Autuch, uh, was actually burned to the ground. Um, so a part of our history is, like we said, has been taken from us, but we never forget who we are and who we come from. And the importance of Ielmoch to me is, is my family. Thank you. So, uh, pardon? Oh, okay. So, when we talk about uh, Ayelmo, um, you know, good good lands, good camping grounds, you know, there's two different dialects. There's Hunk Aminam, which is uh, spoken by uh, Musqueam Slewatuth, and Skohomish Snitchum, um, with the Squamish peoples. And that's why there's two different uh, variations of spelling. And we're gonna be seeing that throughout all of our uh, design phases, uh, signage, and also different ways how to imprint this within our own uh, properties. Um, when you think about the MST coming back together, and you know, before when, when colonization happened, the intent was to um, divide us and, and really not have us practice our, world, our, our ways of being anymore. And so that happened for many years, of course, with all of the different other um, atrocities, you know, with residential school and the potlatch band and, and many, many more, um, not considered being a, a people, you know, uh, we were just them. And so being able to vote in Canada, not until the 50s and the 60s and the discrimination and enfranchisement of, you know, uh, of, of many different things. So after many dec uh, decades, you know, our, I know our late leaders and I know some of our past ones, uh, uh, late uh, Leonard George talked to us like we've been talking about this for, for many years about coming together again. And that was all solidified in, in 2014 with the leaders that are still present today and the ones that are past in the spirit world. That they really went and met in Musqueam Longhouse and they said, let's put our difference aside and put all of our out here on this imaginary hook and let's come together as one family again and let's be a true representation of who we are and what this land is, what we call now as Vancouver, for the future gener generations of our, of, our, of our members. And so that officially happened in 2014, but that really started um, the, during the 2010 Olympic Games. You know, we actually knew that the world was coming to our territory. We needed to come together, be one family, and that really started to rekindle and reignite that love for one another. We knew it was always there, but now it was just there, even stronger. And that's what really started unraveling uh, this beautiful relationship that we have of, of based on kinship and, and love and respect. And so in 2014, four years later after 2010, we signed our a historic protocol agreement. Uh, this is our, our, our mission, like our purpose statement. Um, I'm not sure if you can read it from up there. Um, but after this was another historic uh, joint venture signing uh, with uh, Canadian Lands uh, corporation to really solidify the, the different properties that we were uh, that we were purchasing together. Yeah, sure. 
Um, here we have um, the signing agreement with a lot of our, you know, most of our counselors. And, you know, it's really nice to see that we have Alison Fraser from Musqueam. She was present at the time, Sequalia Ann Wanuk. And, you know, as Jen said, her, um, her mother was the chief of Tsleil-Waututh at the time. So when we talk about these kinships and relationships between, you know, the three nations and, um, you know, we talk about that in our longhouse, as Dennis said, you know, you put your differences aside and that is a form of colonization that they were wanting to separate us. And with that separation, um, we decided, we, we were thinking more of ourselves, our own communities. We're thinking, oh, I'm Musqueam, I'm Squamish, I'm Sabletooth. And a lot of it, you know, what we can do to, together and, you know, when we brought on the, the development corporation um, of MST and that with that agreement and, you know, we signed on da David Negrin and, you know, we appreciate all the work that he's done for us. And um, when we think about all the land base that we have um, with MSTDC and all the works and the great work that Canada Lands has done, you know, they're, um, they've been really great working with us and giving us that opportunity to, to show them who we are as Musqueam, Squamish, and Sabletooth and being able to share um, the, the thought and the mindset that we have and how we used to work prior to contact and being able to showcase and roll that into our new development. So when we take a look at these lands, we're gonna be able to share our rich history, our knowledge, and it's not just gonna be what you're hearing tonight. What we've been working on has been, you know, every time we talk, there's something new that comes out. And, you know, we start to remember different things that we've heard as we were growing up. And, you know, that being able to, to share that with, with you you know, has been very important and it was without our leadership, you know, and their mindset at that time to continue on the work um, to become, you know, united once again. So when the process began with the engagement with the NMST nations and the community members, we put a, we put a calling out to our members via um, email, <clears throat> via email, community notices, telephone calls, of course can't leave out Facebook. So we, we went through all the steps to encourage our people to come out to the meetings and share their knowledge, share their stories. We even had the children come upon and sit with us and they were able to engage with our elders and, and spend some time with them and listen to what they had to say and my screen's not moving. Up top here. Oh, there we go, thank you. So what happened here is when we went to different communities, um, we asked the stories, we asked them to tell the stories so we could come together and create these stories to be a part of a part of the land that we are sharing with you, that we are all sharing together. Those stories are going to be incorporated within. And what it ha happens here is, look at my best friend in the corner and I have her earrings on and I didn't know I was going to wear them today. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to thank you all for taking that time out because if you're, you are not present here, you wouldn't know about who we are as Musqueam people or Slable Tooth or Squamish people. So you're taking the time out of your day to come and learn a little bit about who we are. And we've been here since the time of memorial. And I would like to think that um, my grandparents and my grandparents, parents and great grandparents are, are proud of of who we are and where we're standing at this moment because it's been a long time coming. And I'm very proud of our team. I'm very proud of our youth that came to these gatherings. I'm very proud of the elders, our leadership, and then three nations that are working together. So thank you for your time and thank you for being here and thank you for learning about us too as Quomoth people, as indigenous people to these lands.
So one of the, the, the unique and authentic ways that we uh, get to be creative in our meetings is how can we imprint our, our cultural ways of being into the Western development process, you know, known as overarching guiding principles. You know, uh, we think of CDIs, cultural design inspirations. We have uh, different terminologies that we use. And one of the things that really came to mind when we were working on IELMA was this MST cultural world. And I'm going to set a little bit of pre-context because a, a, a spindle whirl is something that is specific to Coast Salish territories. And it was a very significant tool to help twine and wool, uh, gra gather all of the mountain goat wool or either our Salish woolly dog fur, you know, to keep us warm. But they were able to twine it with their hands and then use a spindle whirl technique to make it finer and really t uh, 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 twined and, and really um, clear. And, and so you can properly you know, do some really detailed designs in, in uh, weaving. And so that's why we came up with a cultural, uh, MST cultural world. Um, and this is an image, um, Celesia from Musquim, uh, spinning our, the yarn. And the circle that you see in the middle of, of, uh, is the spindle world. And so we took this as an inspiration for us in Ayelmo to create the MSD cultural world. When we're thinking about our cultural design inspirations, our overarching principles and, and guidelines. On this next page, you will see the beginning, the inner circle of this cultural world, uh, MSD cultural world, that starts with three CDIs, cultural design inspirations, starting with the land, telling stories of the MST people and these lands, and a place of gathering and abundance. This is the, the inner one that keeps us twined together, the strongest. And it also represents Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, the three that are setting the, the, the tone for this. The next, say, middle circle, as we're unpeeling and we're finding different layers is our cultural site planning elements. There's seven of them. Celebrating the MST partners, partnership, honoring the ridge, being stewards of trees and canopy, water as life giver, a place of arrival, spirit of the longhouse, and living with nature. We will walk through those seven site planning elements after, uh, throughout this day. But seven is also a very important number within our indigenous um, worldviews. What we do today will affect the next seven generations. What we do today is not going to benefit us now. We're planning for our great, great, great grandchildren, our kids and our nieces and nephews. That's who we're planning for. And so that has always kept us grounded in the work that we do uh, in all of the projects. We don't go to a table and think about now. We go to the table, it's like, hmm, does that align with our cultural values? Does this affect the long, long-term um, sustainability of our nations? And so that's the, that's the inner layer. Uh, then we go to the, the outer layer, which is 14. And this one is the cultural design principles. That's very small, but to I will, it's, uh, yeah, I can't read that in there. I don't need glasses, yes. <laughs> But uh, this is, um, and when we started seeing these, these diagrams keep popping up, this is where the, the, the authentic creativeness comes within us as Indigenous peoples. We're like, this looks like this. This can be played off like this. And we're, here we are, we're creating this new, this new way of development, of, of, of thinking through the, the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil uh, So yeah, this is a, a unique piece that's really specific to this project, an MST cultural role. Thank you. Um, I just want to talk about, when I talk about MST, I think about our family kinship. And a, a lot of the time we take a look at where our families come from and how we're tied to the land and tied to the people. When I talked about um, Kaya Palano and you know, how we descend from him, 
And, you know, we take a look at Charlene and this, you know, we talk about our, our marriages. When I was talking about resources, uh, a lot of the time our families who, um, what we, we, we come from different um, societies and um, we come from a, a class system that was made and we married amongst those people. So when we have that, we always made sure that those ties were, were brought and our families were shared. And when we think of the, that family system, we, we think about where we are. And you know, so I'm gonna talk about my daughter, for instance. Um, her, her father is from Musqueam. And he, he is um, from the Point family. And there, her um, Arlene Point, um, she, Arlene Fraser, but she was in knee Point. Her, her mother was a, a Thomas from Sabletooth. And I, you know, I was talking with Kilona's grandmother one time about their family tree. And so she's, you know, going up the generations because we're always taught to know, you know, who, who you're related to because then you know who you can marry. And you know that that's always that that thought. You know, I'm like you know, you, you have to to be sure that you know you're not related to somebody. <laughs> so my poor daughter is not going to be able to marry anybody. <laughs> um, so when we think about those ties, we think about you know, in a sense, that partnership. We talk about that. You know, we talk about all of us being together, and you know, we've always shared these lands together, and. You know, our, you know, our families work, you know, very well together when it comes to our traditional longhouse. And, um, you know, we're, we're building, you know, different collaborations of artwork. And the artwork is not just going to be pieces of art. We want to be able to build um, the buildings to, to represent who we are as well. We want to be able to see it and know that you, when you're entering um, the Heatherlands, when you're entering Iyamuk, that you know you're entering an MST community. And uh, you know, you take a, take a look at some of, uh, you know, some of the pieces that you'll have. Um, you know, the design inspirations, you know, are, you know, are going to come together with traditional um, designs that we had in our past. You know, the, the different archways that we used and those represent who we were as a family. When you see a design, you know, a certain family lived in that home. A certain family lived, you know, in a certain area. That way you knew um, where you were entering. And when we, you know, we all had house posts and, you know, our, we, Kelvin talked about our names. So, you know, our names go with, with families and, you know, that, that history um, is when you were able to say your name, you didn't have to say where you were from because people knew where you were from once they knew your name. And, you know, those partnerships between the three of us, you know, on our name, our name, our family names, that's where we're able to, to tie ourselves to the different areas. And, um, you know, we, we take a look and we take the inspiration, um, you know, from our past. And within that, with, with that, you, you know, the designs, we want to be able to incorporate um, the, different, the different ideas in the buildings. You know, you take a look at, you know, we have, you know, different spaces that will, you know, we're, we'll include the inspiration, you know, from weaving. And, you know, we have a, a few weavers in our community um, you know, one of them is here today. You know, she's my cousin. Um, you know, she's a wonderful weaver. I'm going to call her out. Um, you know, we have in the middle here, it, it's a cedar hat. You know, we had different styles of hat, hats that we wore, you know, to keep us, you know, from, from the elements, from the rain, from the sun, and, you know, in our longhouses. So, you know, these are different, different ideas that, that we're going to, to bring forward. And then we'll bring it on to, to Calvin. So one of the first uh, design elements we want celebrated and noted and kind of kept in mind through the design process of, of Eyalmo is living with nature. Uh, and living with nature is something many, not many, but all of our people across the world have done for hundreds of thousands of years. 
It's a way of living that kept us alive through the, the hardest times. And it's only through the past you know, few hundred years, a few, few hundred years, few thousand years that you know, this new way of living is kind of put forward and prioritized. But something we want to return to is, is living with nature. <clears throat> uh, as um, Dennis said, and as Adrian talked about, um, Aalmuk was kind of an economic epicenter. And uh, one exclusive to the Squamish Nation was the use and carving of um, many of our ocean-going canoes. Um, my distant relatives who lived on this land were canoe carvers as well as master canoe carvers. Uh, it's, a, it's a profession I have um, recent, most recently taken upon myself as well. But from the history that I was told that a lot of the nations up and down the coast, as far, uh, as, far north as Haida Gwaii, used our canoes in their culture. The, the Squamish people, the, the carvers, um, my distant ancestor being one of them, carved the canoes for, for these people. And just the, the way how rich the land was is something we want celebrated and kind of brought forward again uh, in, in a bit more of a modern sense. Um, one, of the, one of the things I always say about living in Vancouver, more specifically on the North Shore, but Vancouver in general, is that you look out your front door and you know the world is at your front door. You got the, the, the big city, YVR, like everything is accessible through your front door. But you go out your back door and you look and that's Mother Nature, your roots, where you were connected to. And that's just something we want celebrated as MST in one of the, in the our cultural design elements. Which, uh, which brings me to our um, next cultural design element, which is uh, stewards of the trees and canopies. So as I said, many of the trees that were once on Aomuk and are still there were part of the rich resources that many of our people used uh, in, the distant, in the distant past. And one of the things that my grandfather always says in prayer and giving honors to the four directions of that. So he starts off with say, saying, you know, we honor those that fly in the sky. We honor the creatures that swim in the sea. We honor the four-legged, the ones that walk on the land. And the last one he always gives honor to is the root people, which is not just, you know, the people of the roots, roots not just plants and shrubs, but the trees as well. And many of the trees that still stand on Ayamuch today and stand all over Vancouver have stood on Ayamuch for many generations and have watched many of our generations go over the past you know, several hundred years. And preservation of the trees and the canopy or the celebration of new life with new trees and new canopies is a, is a big factor in what in which we want sort of prioritized in the building of Aalmuk, in the structure that Aalmuk will be brought to you in the near future. So uh, I'll hand it off to the next slide. Thank you. We have a place of arrival um, when we talk about um, what it is to, to come to Iamoch. It's a place of celebration. And in the past, when I talked about war, peace happened after. There was peace treaties signed between the... Nequitaq? The Lehuitaq. Um, I was trying to remember what we called them. The Kwakwakwak. And when I talked about the peace treaties and I talked about that, you know, it's welcoming. And we want to be able to welcome the, the world to Jericho lands. And through that, we're, the inspiration that we're going to have um, when we talk about facing the water, um, everything that we do um, has to do with the water. And when our, you know, our villages 
uh, the the design concept of some of our buildings. Uh, you know, we had the certain areas facing in you know in different directions. So we want to be able to have like the center when we talk about um, the way our communities are laid out. You know, our celebrations, our communal um, longhouses were usually central, and then the living lo longhouses you know went around and with that we were able to uh, be able to see who was coming into our areas and Charlene will talk about that um, in a little bit uh, in, the, in the next slides but when we think about welcoming we want to be able to when I said we want to be able to see it in the buildings but we want to be able to see it in welcome posts we want to be able to see it in the ground and any way that you're coming, you're going to know that you're there. And you know we have the, um, the 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 train system coming through, so that's going to be a standpoint that will actually bring you to the original site of Ialmo, and that's going to connect, um, you know, to the Jericho Beach. It's going to connect the you know the corridor along the way, uh, you know, along Fourth, and we want to be able to have that shared system come through. Um, you know, adjoining the different um, cornering community already alongside, uh, you know, of our property, you know, in the Blen you know the Blenheim area, and then out to UBC. So when we talk about that arrival, we want to be able to, for you to be able to see it as soon as you arrive in any direction in the property. May it be, you know, a softer edge for the, you know, the people that li are living along Eighth Avenue that you know, they've. Want, lived there, for, you know, for years as well, and they're, you know, they're used to it being a single family, you know, dwellings. But we, you know, the city's growing, and you know, we want you, you know, we want to share that property to, you know, to to showcase us, and you know, we're talking about that softer edge. We're talking about it, it not, and it's actually it's going to be not the grid system that you're normally going to see. Our roadways will be. You know, we want to make them make them special, make them special to us to to incorporate who we are. Uh, and then next, um, we we're, we talk about uh, the spirit of the longhouse, and when we're talking about spirit of the longhouse, I'm not talking about our buildings that we lived. I'm talking about that the feeling that you get from being in the longhouse. The feeling uh, that I receive of, you know, sitting in our winter home in our ceremonies comes from the teachers that we have. And a, a lot of the time, it, it will reflect the cultural views of each of our three nations. And, you know, we have a lot of great leaders who, who sit and talk to us. And when I talk about our winter ceremony, uh, you know, a lot of the time, we're in there, and that's where our learning our learning happen our learning happens, and you know we have our our family share different stories. They you know in the in the ceremonies we have namings, we have weddings, we have funerals, you know, and we have different you know different ceremonies that happen. And when that feeling that I get when I'm in our longhouse, that's the spirit I'm talking about when it comes to the spirit of the longhouse. So when I'm talking about that, we wanna be able to sh um, show that in the design and being able to um, share our singing, our songs, our prayers. The, the longhouse is, in a sense, our church. And you know, w with the songs that we, that we share, those are one and the same as what we what we call a prayer, and uh, each family, you know, we we have different different songs, and we don't like to say that they're composed because in a time, at the beginning of time, the songs used to 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 fly in the sky, and at at one point, someone would hear the song, and it was important to that time, you know, in someone's life, and it was important, and it was shared. And then songs sometimes have words with them. And if you, you know, at the beginning you heard um, three different songs that were playing across the, the video that was playing. So, you know, we have songs for everything. You know, it's celebration. Uh, and so that, in a sense, is what we're talking about when we're talking about Spirit of the Longhouse. And um, 
you know, coming up up to that, we'll have um, Charlene speaking about honoring the rich. Thank you. My mic on? Okay, thanks. I can't stay still. I got to move around a little bit. <clears throat> Um, honoring the Ridge. Honoring the Ridge is a, a place of um, a lookout, a place for we as Musqueam people would go to the point to look out for friends or foes that were coming in. We would have those canoes out in the waters. We would have those warriors hiding within the, um, the trails, but in order to look, take care of that ridge, we would be on there absor absor absorbing the fresh air, the um, tranquility that was also out there. So that is where we would spend our time as warriors to look to see who was coming into our waters. But not only that ridge is special to it, not only that, but within that ridge, it brings in the, the cold air, the warm air, where at one time we could dry our fish. We could wind dry our fish from this, this certain point. Within this ridge, if you look to the background, I'm going to tell the story of my, um, my father, Susumpkin. And it's a story that has just come out to, um, it's just come alive now that Jericho has become a piece of um, my heart and my, my group's heart. But within the background, you'll see a focus of the mountain. The mountain there is uh, the princess. She's a beautiful Musqueam princess. As my, my, my friend here said that earlier, the um, Haidas would come down, they would steal our women. They would steal our women, and my father would always say, that's why they came. They came for our women. They're, they're gold, they're beautiful, they're spiritual, they're, they're lovely. But when he told me the story of the mountain, the mountain is, it's a princess, she's sleeping. You can see her, you can see the mane of her hair, you can see her breasts, you can see her hands lay upon her stomach. She was in the, she was out there and she was looking for, she was looking for her son when the great flood had come upon. She was out there looking for her son and she got tired, she got weary, she be, become um, weakened and hungry. We have a, we have Helch, Helch is our, our spiritual guide. He turned her into stone. He thought, she's too tired now, let's let her rest. And yet, and behind this, behind her is her son. Her son lies behind her. He went to go look for her when the great flood had taken place, but he could not find her. He got weary, he got weak, he got tired, he got sick. He finally found his mother. And when he found his mother, Helk, our God, said he put him to rest. He also lays there beside his mother, turned to stone. Now when you go to the ridge and you go to, you're looking at West Point Gray. So you got West Point Gray School here. You come up, you look above, and you look towards the North Shore. You're gonna see her sleeping. To this day, I bet you didn't know that story, that legend, but now it has come alive it has come alive because I, I, it was my turn to bring it forward. It's been, the story and the legend has been sleeping for a long time. And it was amongst my family that this legend was told. And I asked my uncle, to whom um, has now passed, and he was the professor, uh, Michael Q, at the UBC um, Anthropology. And he told me, he said, Charlene, if your father told you this legend, you bring it out now. It's been lying and it's been lying quietly and it's time to come alive. And I just wanted to share that with you because now those of you that are familiar with that area are gonna go take a look and you're going to see her. She'll be lying there and she'll be lying there with her son. And I wanted to also give you a little something else was 
We're speaking of canoes and we look at our canoes and our canoes we can see when they're coming through that ridge. We have a, a canoe carver here within our within Musqueam that is Martin, if you could just put up your hand. He is um, doing a canoe right now at Lang uh, Lord Bing, Lord Bing School. Yeah, so he is he's carving right now if you'd like to go and take a look there about the canoes, but within that ridge is where we would watch those canoes come in. And I just want to tell a little story about um, the canoe we have. We had a great racing canoe. Musqueam was powerful. Musqueam was strong. And we had a canoe called the Seven Sisters. The Seven Sisters was one of the trees that came out of Stanley Park. There were seven trees there together. Seven of them were together. Musqueam took one, took one of those sisters and built a powerhouse of a racing canoe that won many, many championships. I just had to let uh, mention that as, as we were speaking in regards to canoes. So I'd like to thank you, Heichka. So our next uh, design element would be water as a life giver. So when we talk about the Salish Sea, the broad inlet, what connects all of our families together, it really is centered around the water. Without the water, then our long withstanding economies, <clears throat> societies, our ways of life would collapse. That is what holds our resources. That's what's so rich in all of the food that we eat and the, what we eventually trade, it's all of our our stock, it's all of our resources. So water is a source of life for that, for the food, for the food that we get, the, the salmon, the sturgeon, the, self, uh, the shellfish that we have in there and all of our animals, all the, the, the ecosystems, they live within all of these waterways. And the water can be seen as a highway, a way to travel. You know, we talk about our kinship, our connections, um, slave tooth connections to Musqueam, to Squamish, it would only take you just to grab your canoe and get into our waterways and then go, and that's how you could find your extended family. That's how you could find your, uh, your future families. It would be where you find your friends. And like mentioned with, uh, mentioned before, you know, place of arrival and on the, uh, honoring our ridge, uh, you know, we knew who it was. We knew it was our Squamish family coming in. Our Musqueam family knew it was us that were coming in through these waterways. It was our shared waterways. And you can also view all of our, these waterways, not only of a highway of our diplomacy, you know, how we interacted with each other, but also of commerce. And this is our commercial highways because we would stock up all of our canoes in whatever material, whether it's wool, whatever it was. You know, I like the salmon that comes from uh, you know, your neck of the woods versus the salmon that we like here. We would stockpile it up. It could be tens of thousands of dollars worth, you know, accounting for inflation now. It could be tens of thousands of dollars worth of material, of food that we are bringing to our families there to trade and to bargain and to, to enrich not only ourselves but nourish all of our families in our neighbor, neighboring nations. And so the de design elements uh, is, ex uh, you know, the access to water is going to be fundamental in the design principles. It's providing a connection to our communities. It's also connecting our spirits. So, you know, when you, when you think about mindfulness and trying to meditate, water can be seen as, you know, in the sound, the tranquility of it as a time for reflection. It's a time for a ceremony. We've used water for ceremony, for healing, you know, restoring both our body and our minds. So it's even when you're walking through these, uh, through the Jericho lands, you could hear the sounds of the water, it could calm you down, you could go for a nature walk. That's, that's long withstanding our people's ways of using the water as a healing source, as something that was important for us and reflected and our mindfulness. It was also, if you see all the shops, you know, there's gonna be uh, shops that are gonna be all around there, you know, where people, small businesses or what, that, that's signifying, you know, our highways of commerce. You know, this is where we did our business. To do our business, we had to get onto the waterways. We had to go and travel there. Just the same as going to be here. That's where the business will be taking place. So this development will make uh, opportunities to reveal all of these water, whether it's ponds, it's fount, 
fountains, celebrate its, celebrate its sights and sound. It brings opportunity to, for everyone who interacts, whoever comes by to have direct contact with that water, whether it's just healing yourself, mindfulness, whether it's through the businesses and cleansing. So along with standing is our water is central in all of our um, origin stories. All the stories that we tell, water is a central part of this, so it really does make up a, a big pivotal moment of, of who we are. It's something in the background. It's, so that's why a lot of these other el elements, you know, water is a basis of it. It's where we come for welcome and it's where we arrive. It, it tells a lot of our history. So in the design concepts, it will look at a, a restoration and renaturalization of stream. Uh, there'll be wetland features, weaving water throughout the site and through connection uh, to the sea that is of Jericho Beach Park. These are the lawn parks, you know, Jericho Beach, English Bay, Stanley Park, um, the Sailor's Sea, Burrard Inlet. These are all long with stand that connects uh, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slay with Tooth to these waterways, and it's gonna be a very pivotal part of, of the Jericho lands. OCM so as the beautiful things that happen of just listening and, and participating and, and very fortunate just to hear how all of our relatives spoke, really spoke about our MST cultural world. If you think about the cultural elements of a Coast Salish blanket, there are certain um, emblems and patterns that speak to place to the background, to the landscapes, to being the water people, to different legends, and they're all interwoven. We just, in a way, showed how we are going to interweave all of these cultural site planning elements within Ayelmo through our diagram of an MST cultural world. Um, that really ends our, our presentation. Yep. Oh, yep, yep. Okay, we're going to have Skelet tonight come up. But uh, we're good. Okay, here we go. Um, one thing that we we normally do when we're we're in ceremony is um, we show our we don't show our wealth by what we have. We show our wealth by what we can give. Um, so we have a little gift for for each of you um, as you're leaving. We're going to have. Uh, our youth ambassadors um, hand out something that was made by three of our community members. Um, we have my cousin Chrissy, I was saying she's a great weaver. Um, we have a gift, she's made some of them and um, we also have um, one of my good friends, um, Lislot Thamat from Musqueam, or from Squamish, uh, also was one of the weavers and then we had someone from um, Slable tooth as well. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what they are, but there's going to there's a little card that just it just sig signifies um, who the the artists were, um, and that'll be a gift for you. But before we end, you know, the Slido is going to be coming up, I believe. Um, Chris can tell you a little more about that. Thank you very much um, to all of our cultural liaisons. Yes, you will get something on your way out, but don't leave yet. Um, so thank you, um, Charlene, Skaltanot, Skonston, Huanok, and Hannes very much for sharing uh, with us this evening and on behalf of those of us in the theater and, and those watching on the live stream, um, thank you to each of you for sharing about your culture um, and uh, what it means to you to be planning and developing uh, your lands um, and uh, your openness uh, to welcoming people from all walks of life uh, to share what these lands have to offer. Um, so. Um, as promised, though, we are going to take a few questions, so you, you're not off the hook quite yet. Um, for those of you who, uh, I know there are some questions that have been populated into Slido here, um, please feel free to uh, enter some more, um, and, uh, and, and I'll, I'll start with, uh, with these here. So um, the first one I want to come to is around um, the longhouse and the, the spirit of the longhouse. And, um, 
the question is, can you, can you explain more about how the gathering nature of the longhouse, how that might um, work on the lands? Like what's the, how does the spirit of the longhouse manifest? Um, when we talk about the spirit of the longhouse and how everything's going to be gathering, we're gonna work that into you know, a community center or a cultural center or you know, the playing fields. Um, even within the design concept, when you think about a community, we want to be able to, uh, instead of having like an individual, you know, picnic table, we want to have a longer one and, you know, make it more welcoming to, to everybody to sit together and get to know one another. And I think that's one big thing when you live in a, in a city or when you're living in a complex, you don't know who your neighbors are anymore. And, you know, you're not able to, you know, go over and borrow a cup of sugar, like, in the past and you know I, I think about um, what it is to to know who who your neighbors are and being able to do that with within the site is we want to be able to make the design so that it is welcoming for everybody to be together and everything that we do we do around our family we do around our community so we want to be able to, to have that within each of the, the design concepts that we're, we're working on. Thank you. Um, a question about language. I think, uh, Juanak, you started uh, talking about um, language, but the, the fact that, um, you know, as you look at that Inspire Jericho uh, word mark down on the bottom, that there's two different languages shown there, and then, you know, um, as you will have seen, Jericho lands follows um, in English. Could you just speak a bit more about those two, uh, the languages, the pronunciation, the meaning of Ialmoch, Ialmoch? Um, Ialmoch is a, a Hankaminam word, and uh, we have made ours, you know, similar, and it means um, a good land. And when we talk about the good land, we we talk about those resources. You know, I talked about that everything and the whole reason why that was one of our summer homes was because it was rich. It was rich with all our foods. And um, when you see Ialmoch and Ialmoch, it's because we do have two different dialects, Hankameen and Skahot Misnechem. And you can see it popping up around Vancouver. We have a lot of different sites now across the street at the Vancouver Art Gallery. Um, we were a part of the naming ceremony a few years ago, and um, I, I, one of them is Chuchlanek, and that has to do with like winning, and, but also at Queen Elizabeth, um, there's Chuchlashen, um, Chuchlashen, and Chuchlashen is, um, is a, a celebration, and there's, uh, I don't know if you know about that, there's a new park, Rainbow Park. Um, we call it Sikhsahwe in Squamish. Um, myself and Calvin are Squamish language speakers. We, you know, I've been learning um, for quite some time. And so when we, when we think of that, we want to be able to, to share in, in both. And recently, you know, I was taking a Hankaminam class um, a few winters ago, and of course, you know, COVID got in the way of that, and I wasn't able to to finish. But that's also because you know a lot of our people, um, for instance, were able to speak different languages. We didn't just speak Squamish; we spoke Hakamalem, Upriver, Hunkaminam, Lower River, you know, across the island, um, Chinook jargon, Kukwakiwak, Kwakwala. Um, Sinchothan, um, you know, those are different Salish languages uh, that were around. But when we think about who we are as the Musqueam and Squamish people, we want to be able to share both of our languages and, you know, with hopes that being able to, you know, you scan a QR code that you can hear our people being able to, you know, will say the words and you can hear them to understand you know, to to hear different people say, you know, maybe they'll there'll be a story or the different words, but we want to be able to to make it um, Squamish and and um, you know Skohomish and in Hunkaminam. Sure. Yes, Heitka. My name is Charlene. 
My, um, as I said, my father's name was Sasumpkin. I'm Sasumpkin to not. Now, I am a daughter of a chief to whom went to residential school. My father spoke the language fluently. It was his first language. His mother spoke it fluently. It was her first language. Her, his father spoke it fluently. It was his first language. But when it came to my siblings and myself, when we lived in our home, it wasn't spoken to. We weren't spoken in our Hunkleminam language for the fact that um, my father was strapped for speaking the language along with his siblings. So I belong to a family that comes from a home that their first language was Hunkleminam. And I, myself, cannot speak it. I can speak somewhat, I can understand some, but I am in still um, revitalization. I'm still in the process of trying to learn myself. I'm the youngest of my um, 13 siblings. Well, the youngest girl, I do have a younger brother. And then the only people within my siblings that could speak the language was my eldest sister, to whom is 73, and then my late brother, um, Henry Charles, to whom went out to visit the elders within Musqueam to, to learn the language himself. So within my household, it was lost. And it was lost not because of my father, it was lost because of the way he was treated. So just from a linguistic standpoint on the name Eomoch and the two variations, uh, in, in the Hunkamina variation, if my understanding is correct, I or A is the root word, which means good. And in, in the, uh, so for Squam, um, Salish languages, they are built on prefixes, root words, and suffixes that go at the end. So at the end, is moh, and in Skokmish there are two suffixes, there's moh and meh, which are the root words of the earth, of land, or the land that, like earth, dirt, or the land that something sits on. And <clears throat> one of the determiners of how old a word is, like, because we can't carbon date words, but we can kind of trace back how words, how the simplicity, how the simplicity of the word, its root, or how many meanings it has. And uh, as you can see, the, the, the two roots of the word eyalmuch are at the end, which is moch and meoch, which is uh, linguistically a great connector of how old and how shared some of these languages are um, across Salish country, you know, up and down the Fraser River and over to the adjacent um, island of Vancouver Island. Uh, a lot of the dialects have similar roots and similar suffixes to the ends of uh, a lot of their words, um, which was one of the things that kind of just connects us all and shows that we were once all one people and something we're trying to celebrate today. Awesome. And that's just one of the most beautiful things about working on these projects is just what you just heard right now. It's exciting, it's, it reignites the spirit of something that was our first language, that something that was trying to be eradicated, but here it now is, is coming back. For me, this is, is exhilarating, it's exciting. I get to learn from Adrian, I get to learn from Char, I get to learn from Constant, and I get to learn from Hannes, and if we don't know what the word is, we go back to our language knowledge holders, and I learn more. And then I come back saying these words to my family, to my uh, uh, friends and relatives, and to each other. So. When it comes to language, we're seeing this revitalization of something that, you know, was forced to, to be extinct. And, and there are some languages that are extinct. And there's some that are on the verge of being extinct. But it's, it's through our own nations having our cultural program, our language programs to, to, re, to reignite that. But I honestly believe that these development projects are a, a, a big contributor for us to actually re-put our language back on these lands. 
And so that's one of the things that I'm really looking forward to because it's not only going to transcend through just audio recordings or a QR snap, it's going to be embedded throughout this whole project. And pretty soon we're going to be speaking uh, both of our dialects as, you know, uh, 10 years down the road. And it's going to be an amazing sight to see. Thank you. So here's a question that to segue off of what you were just saying, um, you know, are there ways that the design of, of um, the lands would encourage multi-generational interactions and, and chances for, for youth, um, you're still young, um, uh, to, uh, to learn from, from the knowledge of, of your elders. How, how, does the, how does the design of the site itself help that interaction happen? Yeah, well that's the, when you think of, um, when you think of like our traditional village sites, everything was interconnected and had a purpose and it was built intentionally. So that we, you know, we weren't the best at everything. We had people that specialized, they had a gift and we honored that. It was this sense of, I don't need to also compete with you in this, where you're gonna excel in that, but you know, there's gonna be areas where other people are gonna excel, but yet you respected each other. And that's how our societies lived. It's, it's um, you know, so within this Western way of thinking, it's about me, 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 and I, I, I. We're trying to come back to our concepts of, of a healthy and successful uh, modern village site. And within that, we want to imprint. So instead of it being called like a high school or an area where there could be, you know, an elder center or a retirement home, we're pairing that with a daycare right beside it. We're pairing it with a school beside it because that's called transfer of knowledge. That was very significant in our longhouses and our ceremonies is we learned who we are and where we come from, from my ta'a or for my grandpa, and then my mom, or my dad, and there's that continuation, that circle of life. And this is where we want to do it, but in a modern context. That's what gives us joy, is you know seeing our kids thrive and grow. One day I'll be a grandfather, and I'll see my grandchildren uh, shine and grow. And for people that are within, um, you know, within these modern development sites, we're creating these touch points, these, these areas of connection these layers of, of, of pa crossing paths where we can have that moment of, of exchanging culture and who we are. Thank you. Um, here's a question. Uh, I imagine the, the uh, MST, uh, the cultural design world, took a lot of collective effort to develop. You've spoken about the, um, the amount of time that you've spent together. Um, and, uh, and also, obviously, um, the engagement you've done with your community members to help inform that. Are you applying that to other MST projects beyond Ialmo? Yeah, yeah, well, just to touch, um, touch on, like, even our Heatherlands, it, we, we came up with the four elements of life. That was specific to that project. This one was uh, this, now the cultural world, but it just came naturally. You know, all of the information, like, never really came from us. It came from our elders. It came from our membership. It came from our, our, our youth um, and uh, our parents and, and family members. And when you synthesize this information, when we bring it back with our design team, who are all here, thank you for being a part of this journey. We were able to come up, like, we started seeing three, we started seeing seven, we started seeing this, and we just merged both of them together. And it like naturally, uh, authentically just sort of came up and you know, uh, it's just one of those things that's really exciting when, when, we, when we start doing work like this together because we're starting to um, you know, think of our cultural teachings and what we know, but you know, we're in a way we're able to document this new stuff um, in, a, in a cultural uh, two-eyed seeing approach. So it's really nice. Edie, did you um, there's a question that says, uh, how will the city, and I imagine this is, you know, the, the perhaps non-Indigenous population living in the city of Vancouver today, how will the city be welcomed into these lands? I think with how the city is going to be welcomed, um, I know we've been doing a lot of work with the, the city of Vancouver, and they've been doing a lot of work as well with um, the Truth and Reconciliation. So when we're talking about our designs, um, you know, the first of its kind, we have a cultural interpretive plan. And, you know, that's something that the city doesn't normally require 
for um, you know an, a, a policy statement or for a rezoning application, but it's something that we did um, that shows who we are, but shows how we're going to welcome the community, and we want to be able to um, welcome each other because you know, despite the fact of colonization, um, we've you know overcome everything that's happened to us as a people and you know we're growing and we're thriving and we want to be able to to show you who we are on our own homelands because in the back burner we've been step, stepped over set aside our land's been taken and you know that that's been very tough for our people to see but now we want to be able to say you know what we're here in our lands and I, you know, I say I'm going to retire there. I'm, I'm going to live there. I'm going to live where my family once lived in Yelmo. And I want to be able to share that with the greater community. And, you know, that means, you know, having, you know, social housing. It's not, you know, not going to be, you know, everything. It's not for money. And we talk about how we're going to sustain ourselves. And that's the difference between you know, an MST development is we have three communities to think about. It's not just one family. Um, you know, we we talk about that. We're we're thinking about all of our community members, and when we think about all of our community members, we're thinking about the people that are going to live there. And you know, that's you know that's the people who want to come and share our property and learn about us. I'd like to say though that. We're loving people. We're loving Quomoth people. We're going to invite you all to come stay with us, break bread with us, enjoy our songs. Um, we're going to share our teachings as also as you teach us. Those that are going to come in and, and we're going to live as a community, you're also coming to teach a, a little bit about who you are and we're going to live together. We're going to break bread together. We're going to stroll and listen to those streams together. We're going to enjoy the trees that are there, that are going to be there, that are going to be medicine for the people, the, the people that are coming to live with us in, in those areas. The areas are going to be beautiful for your mindset, for the, the living of, from your heart. It's a, going to be a beautiful place of love. And we are strong people that show and have a lot of love to share. Ejka. So uh, as you previously heard, um, kind of voiced through uh, Charlene here and Adrian pre uh, before, is that a big part of the value, traditional values that we upheld, especially as high class people as CM, it wasn't based on how much you had and collected and consumed, it was based on how much you gave. And at the beginning of these projects, you know, we had the opportunity to take these hunks of land, you know, put up four big fences around our land and section it off into equal thirds. And, you know, just kind of build for our own communities. But, you know, not only would our three communities not have learned from that, the rest of the world would not have learned from that. It'd be something not welcoming and not, it would be something that wasn't a part of what we upheld as people is, you know, we, we, we all gathered on this piece of land once before, why would we not all gather again? And, you know, Vancouver itself is home to not just Muslim, Squamish, and Slavic now, it's home to the rest of the world and that's, something we want celebrated and noted in this land itself is that we want to share this with the rest of the world as well so that the rest of the world knows who we are. So the rest of the world knows that the land that Vancouver resides on is ours, but it's ours to share with you as well. Take a, take a couple of more questions here um, before we wrap up. So here's one, um, looking back to 2019 to now and the journey that's, that's been taken um, on this project, 
uh, well, I suppose Heather, Heatherlands as well. Uh, do you have any lessons learned to share for other nations who have opportunities for partner developments? And, and perhaps, Skonshin, to your point, not just to other nations, but to, to others have opportunities um, uh, you know, to come together on a project. What, what might you share with them as advice? Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the questions. Um, you know, I'm very prepared to always say this because we walk so proudly with humility of what we've been able to accomplish together and do for the greater good of our nations, but also society, uh, the city of Vancouver. And we are being looked at around the world of, of what we're doing here. So it's not just uh, us doing it, even though we're, we're, in, we're zoned in here. We are getting asked from different tribes from back east of how to work with their different municipal government. You know, we got to give kudos to the city of Vancouver. You know, uh, they are, have been um, good um, allies with building a stronger relations with the host nations, with the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil with our protocols, but also helping us, um, you know, with these projects and, and dedicating staff and time. So th them themselves, if, you know, the city of reconciliation and, and really now with the UNDRIP, uh, sort of the 79 calls to actions that we're, we're a part of as well is, is very progressive um, movements politically, but also relationship building within the host nation. So the three nations working together, but also the nations working with the municipal government. It's, a, it's like a, a two-sided approach that we're witnessing now here in Vancouver. So the advice that, um, you know, I think they're... Um, you know, there needs to be that deep connection of like how the MST started. You know, my message was to, to get down and get, uh, go back to ceremony, cultural teachings, to come to a common understanding, a common uh, grounds where the other nations that are, you know, within the same territory with the municipal government that can possibly do the similar uh, objectives and accomplishments we've done, you know, I think it would be great. We're all about sharing. And, and it's not never us, and it's not ours to, to keep. If there is a way that we can help other indigenous communities um, um, accomplish similar things that, that we could do, I'm sure we'll go there in a heartbeat to help out. I think that relationship started also with Canada Lands Company and the work that they do with, you know, turning that around and, you know, they're doing that work across Canada right now, and I think they... You know, they're reaching out to other communities. And I know, you know, some of our design team, you know, they, they've, they've have a lot of people reaching out to them to get to us to say, you know, what could we do? How, how could we mirror and mimic what MST has done? And, you know, we, we, we already have that relationship. So I think people putting aside their differences about different land territory and overlapping, you know, communities. I think being able when we're when we're together as one, we work stronger. And um, you know, that's one thing that you know that my dad always said that he was taught by his grandfather, is you know when you're when you're working together and that strength that you have, you know, with your family. And we're, we are we're all one family, and you know we're showing. We're showing our younger generation, uh, again, that strength. And when you don't have that continuation of knowledge going to your children, I think that that's a barrier. And I think the, the biggest part is being able to have all ages involved. Um, when we talked about engagement, we engaged with with like preschool kids because they had really grand ideas of what they would think. But a lot of the kids that we talk to, their parents are all iron workers. So you think about what their ideas were. Um, but that's the important thing is you're not just talking to adults, you're talking to the children, you're talking to seeking what their dreams are. And when we, we always started with our elders because our elders were the ones who were able to set us and put us in our place if we're doing something wrong or they're be able, a, being able to commend us. And that's the biggest thing that, that we can share as our value of how important each and everybody is in our communities. Um, so speaking of youth, and these are the last uh, two questions that we'll, we'll, we'll take tonight. 
Um, you spoke about the importance of youth, both in the presentation and just in that response. How do you reflect uh, youth and, and um, a youthful quality in the, in the design of, of the land and a place for youth? I think you spoke earlier about daycares next to you know, where elders are and so on. But. That was that was one of you know one of the ideas that we were talking about. I know um, I used to be a teacher, and um, we used to go and visit like elder center. And I know my daughter's um, school did that uh, in West Van. They when she was in grade five, they would walk to to the elder center and sit with the elders. And sometimes. People don't have that opportunity when you're in a retirement home or when you're in a care home, and they don't always have family. But one thing with our communities is we always we always have each other, and that support and the importance of that, and we want to be able to spread that out into you know into those, and in hopes that the children are going to be able to share with the elders in, in, in these care homes. And that's also important for us. And that youthfulness that the children will bring to the elders. And when we have those different, that, that is how everything happens in our communities, is a lot of the time we were raised by our grandparents before. And you know, when you know, m my mom, I call her my mom, and my dad, they were raised by Dominic. So that, those generations that were, were, you're able to share. And it's not just our community. We wanna be able to learn from, you know, from other people that are living there. And that, that youthfulness is, is going to, to, go, to go everywhere. And so just to close off, you've spoken about um, the importance of, of the leaders who have come before you um, and setting up this moment. If you look down, you know, your grandkids, your great grandkids, and they look back on this, what, what do you want them to say about the work that you're doing? I want them to see a picture of their grandma on the building. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a grandmother of, of four. I have a grandson that is 13. Uh, one that is six, one that is three, and one that is uh, one. And um, they're, they're the joy, they're the joy of my life. And I've always mentioned that, okay, when, by the time Jericho's bit, finished being building, I'll be, I'll be in the happy hunting grounds, I'll be one of the ancestors. But uh, I always mentioned, I was going, but when my grandkids go walking by one of the buildings, there's grandma, her face right on the side of it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> what I'd like to envision um, and hope for is the continuation of knowledge and culture. You know, I myself really wasn't fully infused with culture, not until like my late 20s. And from there, I have uh, ran a, a, one of our nation's businesses and I was just consumed with it because it was a lost, you know, it was... It was tried, it was, they, the government tried to eradicate it. So which made me fight even harder to know um, who I am and where I come from and to share that. And so to having, not just being able to do it in the canoes, but being able to do it in built form um, in these mega projects, I am very humbled to continue that knowledge transferring to other generations. That's one of our cultural value systems of learning and understanding history through your elders and through people that have passed along. It's my job to do the best that I can do right now, given what I've, what I've absorbed, and then to make sure that I pass it down. And to see, you know, our great, great nephews and granddaughters and, and our other members, I hope that, that that cyclical, that circle of life continues as, as you know, this world is getting more populated. And sometimes it can be um, very lost for people, and especially in an urban city. You know, there are some challenges for us, and it's very important for us to, these projects, they can always look back and be connected. And, you know, they can go back and see the language. You know, for me in high school, I didn't know anything. There, there's nothing about the Three Nations. 
It was one page and not a 400, not a 400 pages. So to see our kids in our, our own public schools and our own nation schools learning a lot more than I ever did, you know, I think it's going to be a proud moment, you know, 70 years, seven generations later, you know, that, uh, you know, they're going to be always connected and grounded of where they are. So to continue that on. I guess just with the continuation of uh, the statement by Dennis, uh, I too would love to see the continuation of the re relationship between Muskim, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. And just to recognize that that connection was always there and has never been, you know, unkindled or un, you know, unwoven. That connection was, that disconnection was brought to us through colonization and uh, through a colonial way of thinking. And just to recognize that the strength of that relationship may have kind of s smoldered down into, you know, uh, you know a, a few embers, but was kept, kept going through, through many family connections and friendship connections. Um, what one, just I'm very personal to, um, for the first eight years of my life, I was a, you know, a Muslim community member as, as well as um, my mother. I, I myself have, n you know, no relation to, you know, no blood relation to Muslim and, you know, nor does my mother, but the, the people themselves were you know, happy to take us in, and I was a community member myself. I played for their soccer team and continue to play for the soccer team for, you know, throughout my soccer career. <clears throat> and um, just, uh, you know, an another relationship. My friend William here has been, you know, a good friend of mine for the past you know, 10 years or so. And just even just on the stage, like I've had the honor of playing soccer with Dennis through, you know, professional league soccer and just, for that flame to be, just to grow and grow over the years through projects like this. I think for, for me, what, what I want everybody to know is the great work that we did together. It, it started off with Charlene, myself, and Dennis. And um, within the past year, we've brought Calvin and William on. And you know, that there, is a continuation, you know, they're our next generation. And being able to be a part of a resurgence of us being in our homelands. And I talked about, about us showing who we are. And it's not just at Jericho, it's going to be at the Heatherlands. And, you know, we have other properties as well. We wanna be able to let everybody know that we've never left. And we're, you know, the hard work that we've done to get to where we are today, you know, I never would have thought that being disciplined as a child and being told different legends was going to get me here, you know, on stage talking about a development. Because when I was growing up, if one of us was in trouble, we were all in trouble. And when my dad was talking to us, there's always a meaning behind some of our legends. And so that was how we were disciplined. So I'm very grateful for that. And, you know, we talk about different professions. Um, our family, you know, we, we, we were also longhouse builders. So in a sense, my path has already been laid out before me. Um, you know, it's like I've done this before. And my granny, she was a big part of the native housing here in Vancouver. So, you know, she was, she was a big part of that. And, you know, here I am now, a big part of our development for the three nations. And, you know, I want to be able to, to have that shared, that it was something great for the, the three of us to, you know, to work together. And, you know, the two younger, you know, the two younger cultural liaisons and, that's going to continue because these projects are going to be going for some time. And, you know, as Charlene said, you know, she, she's worried that our pictures are going to be on the wall and they're going to be great. They're going to be grand. You know, they, they will. People will know who we are.
What I would like to see um, from this, coming from more of a youth perspective, you know, in the plan process, we got to see, uh, we interacted with all of our children as as young as kindergarten uh, over Zoom, and the, it, they were part of the concept. They were able to put their input of their, you know, from, uh, you know, in many, many decades, they'll be able to tell their children, they'll be able to tell their grandchildren, you know, I was a kindergartner, I was grade one, when I was uh, on Zoom, you know, this was during a crazy pandemic, I was on Zoom as, you know, a six-year-old, I was giving my feedback, I was telling them what I want to uh, be seen uh, in this, in this, uh, in, th in these lands, in these lands that I got to grow up and learn that were actually shared for tens of thousands of years. And even just taking a look back, um, we talk so thoroughly here up here about our shared histories that Yes, there was colonization, there was residential schools, that was a small blimp in what tried to disrupt our lawn 10,000 plus history. We have been here since time immemorial. Uh, we were always together. Um, as Calvin said, what could have happened, do we want our future generations to look that we saw this great opportunity to have reconciliation through infrastructure, through projects like this? Do, do we want them to look at us and see that we divided very clearly with Gates, um, Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh. No, we'd rather show them exactly, um, like like the the seven generation mindset. Another way to look at that is you think of the grand, your great great grandchildren, the t uh, grandparents. Sorry, um, their teachings of you. They told. Uh, uh, generation above us, my generation, generation below us, they told us to get out of that colonial mindset that, you know, you're supposed to be divided and conquered, that you're supposed to um, show only your story. You know, we do want to show our shared history. We want to take this opportunity to showcase through projects like these what our histories are actually like, and then also with that seven generation mindset to think of our future great, great, great grandchildren, the ones that got to help us in this planning process. So we take our teachings from our ancestors and then we make sure that we lay it out here in, a, in, a, in our Huamoch way to showcase that we were united and we do want to develop this and uh, show that we are together. Thank, thank you to all of you for, for your thoughtful responses to all of those, and, and to, the, to you for the questions uh, both here and uh, for those on the live stream, thank you. And um, even if uh, your question, and I know there were questions that weren't read out tonight and answered here, um, we have captured them and, and we will share them with the project team as well as the City of Vancouver <laughs> planning team. So we do have a record um, of the questions that were asked. Um, for those of you in the room when you came in, you might have received a, a postcard um, from City of Vancouver staff. Um, that asks, was there something you heard tonight that inspired you? If you do get a chance to, to complete that, or if you want to complete that, um, please do return it to city staff um, or, or to our team um, as you leave, um, and uh, that would form part of uh, the overall engagement record of, of this process as well. Um, just before I turn it back to Adrian, to, to, you can pump up again okay. the, what people are going to be getting on their way out. I'd like to invi uh, invite Matt Shilito, who's the Director of Special, Special Projects with the City of Vancouver, uh, to say a few words. Uh, on Chen Quen, but... Pardon me? Go after. Oh, okay. <laughs> Didn't know you were coming. <laughs> I wasn't listening. <laughs> Uh, hi, good evening everybody. I'm Matt Shilito. Uh, as Chris says, I'm the Director of the Special Projects Office at the City of Vancouver. Um, it's my great privilege and responsibility to help lead the city team involved in this uh, incredible project and, and opportunity. Uh, for now, I just want to say a few words of thanks on behalf of the city, uh, firstly to the Musqueam, Squamish and Swale, to leaders that we have here today for hosting us this evening. Um, to MSTDC and to Canada Lands for organizing the event and everybody who helped put this on. Um, but I think most of all, uh, it's really special thanks to uh, Charlene, Adrian, Calvin, Dennis, and William for their um, really powerful, uh, inspirational, and really very moving words and presentation tonight. A huge appreciation from us at the city for that. We look forward to our our ongoing collaboration with you through this, through this extraordinary project. Um, in, in terms of next steps, uh, we are, in terms of the formal planning process, we will be holding a major round of public engagement in June, uh, and that will include a proposed site plan, 
and that'll include a lot of details that I think uh, the broader community is very interested in seeing about the future of the site. So please stay tuned. Thank you to all of you for coming out tonight and all for watching online. Uh, we really appreciate your interest in the future of the, of the Jericho lands. Uh, it's obvious from your questions that you found this evening um, as thought-provoking as, as I did. That's really encouraging. Please stay involved. Um, if you want to understand how we've got here and where we're going moving <laughs> forward, please check out shapeyourcity.ca uh, forward slash Jericho lands. There's lots of information on there in the background of the project. And stay tuned for notifications on that for, for next steps. And as I say, June will be the next sort of major milestone in the, in the planning process. So with that, thank you, and I'll, I'll hand back to Chris. All right, you want to tell people what they've won? I'm Chet Quan Man Tommy Up, Quiz Clark Nomo, T. Tuknat Nat, Hot Then Squalloon, Quiz, Quiz is Tuktatani, to Iamoch, Iamoch, Eskako, to Nameth, to Schomat Squam, to Skohotmish, a Testa Slaywit. Um, thank you, everybody, to, for listening to everything that we had to share with you tonight. And um, we have a, a gift that our youth ambassadors will be sharing with you. And I, I said that we, we talked about sharing our wealth. And, um, you know, it's a small gift of appreciation for you sitting here and listening, listening to us share a little bit of who we are as MST. And, um, you know, I would just like to, you know, to thank you again for coming um, this evening. And I would like to recognize my cousin um, here, if you can stand up. She's one of the weavers where she wove some cedar roses um, for you. So with, with our weaving, um, one of, it was weave with cedar, and one of the, the cedar tree is very important to us because we used all parts of the cedar tree for different um, for different things. Uh, we know we talked about our canoes, uh, we talked about uh, our our hats, we talked about mats. You know, our longhouses were made of cedar. Um, we used uh, our branches. Um, you know, they were used for different brushing, Hopayan, and you know, the gift that we have is a, a cedar rose. So we have, again, um, Lislot Tamat, Elizabeth Ross from Squamish, um, and I I, Sarah Thomas. Skeletalit. Skeletalit, I didn't want to mess that up. Um, you know, so we had three different, um, community members help and the, the card will be attached with their names. Um, you know, we have a lot of different, you know, artists in our communities who not only work with cedar, but they work with wool and we want to be able to showcase, um, you know, who some of those people are. And, you know, we have a rich history of in different professions, may it be carving, you know, carving canoes, carving house posts. And you're going to see a lot of this in, in all of the design. So, you know, this is the, just the beginning. And, you know, thank you for coming tonight, Chrissy. And, um, you know, thank you again, everybody, for being here tonight. Thank you, everybody. Um, and please do get home safely. Thank you. <laughs>